High school can be tough. We'll help you navigate some of the areas you need help with, including the college preparation process by providing advice for families. Every student is different and has a unique path. That's why we created this podcast. Our innovative and intentional approach builds confidence in the individual student. Listen each week to find out how students can score better on college placement tests with techniques and methods that build confidence, beat test anxiety, and identify strengths within each student. You're listening to Simply Smarter with hosts Caleb and Jill. Check out our blog at GetSmarterPrep.com for more college prep-related topics. Welcome back. Happy Wednesday. Thanks for listening to our Simply Smarter podcast this week. Today, we have a special guest joining us, our very own college counselor and tutor, Alana Guerin. Alana is going to share what it takes to make a great college essay, give us some tips for preparing college lists, and how she can help with the college admissions process. Let's get started. Hey, Jill. Hi, Lana. How are you? I am great, thank you. Good. It's so good to have you here. I'm very excited to be here. This is my first time on the radio, so yes. I'm very exciting. Awesome. Welcome to the podcast life. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you've been with Get Smarter Prep as a tutor for about a month, so one of our newest tutors, um, but you do have a little bit of college counseling background, so kind of tell us where you came from, and we can kind of start from there. I do have some college counseling background. Um, I am married to a guy who's in the military, which means that we move around a lot. Awesome. And uh, so the different types of jobs I've had in different places we've been, I've been a public high school English teacher. I've worked at actually um, a company a lot like Get Smarter, but in New York, where mm-hmm. I did some college counseling and helped students with their essays and helped them apply to college, sort of similar to the stuff I'm doing here. Right. Um, I taught at a college and it was actually a junior college where we had a lot of students who were applying out to four-year colleges. So I was used to helping them prepare their transfer applications and advising them on where they should be going as well. Mm -hmm. So that was sort of like the extension of the college counseling I did for 12th graders only for two years later. Right. And um, then now we're here. And so I was looking for sort of a similar situation. And I really like working with teenagers and helping them work on their essays and helping them talk about themselves in an interesting way. So this seemed like, you know, a pretty cool place to be working. Yeah. Awesome. I love that. Well, thank you so much for your service and your husband's service and Thank you. Everything that you, um, your husband, you and your husband have done for our country. That's awesome. Thank really you. Really appreciate that. And we're glad you're here in Kansas City. We, we like it so far. It's very cool. I was going to say, what's the best part about Kansas City so far? There's so many good places to eat here. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, our last town did not have very many exciting places to eat, which is such a minor thing. But we go into the plaza and we're like, oh my gosh, there are so many exciting restaurants there here. There are. So, <laughs> there really are. Literally having so many tasty options. Yeah. Like if we're you're a foodie, big oh, foodies. come to Kansas yeah. City for sure. Sure. Super duper exciting and like like lots of like also like nice local types of produce and stuff like that. So mm. which is great for me. My husband's a big carnivore, but oh, nice. uh, yeah. <laughs> which we have barbecue Works here. Works out for Works him out too. For him. Exactly. Yes, so yeah. so yeah, we've been, we've been having actually just a lot of fun exploring Kansas City like restaurants. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that. That's oh, been our jam. That's awesome. <laughs> so we were watching Diners, Drive-ins, and Dives Triple D. Oh, last do night. they have a lot of Kansas options there? They do. Ooh. So this was. I didn't know, like, uh, I don't know. I think they're in their, like, 25th season or something with this mm-hmm. show. Uh, but they had one here in Kansas City, which I was like, oh, oh gosh. great. There's a new one. This is awesome. It's a, it's a new season. Um, and it was a taco place down at the Ooh. River Market. Uh, <gasps> I am I love tacos. I also love tacos. Love. And I actually haven't been to the River Market yet. This oh, is one of these fun. places I just, I keep driving around it, but not through it. And uh-huh. I think I have to, like, get there. Yeah. I hear there's some really amazing donuts also in the River Market. Oh, it's I, like I haven't a been. A rumor that there are like some donuts that okay. I have to be you know okay. checking out of the Well, I know there's a lot of there's a quite a few donut places in the area. That's so a, yeah, everyone I, said I if you imagine. go to Kansas you need to find your local donut place. Mm-hmm. But apparently there's some stall. I got to find out more about this. But uh apparently the River Market has some donuts that I, I guess will not have lived until I've tried. Okay. So, you know, good to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, also I know there's a really good ice cream place down there, Buddy Ray's. Yes. I haven't been, okay. but I've also heard. <laughs> Amazing. So, yes, and so, Alana yeah. is pregnant with her first child. <laughs> yeah, so. so very focused on <laughs> snacks right now. Exactly. 
The pregnant lady always wants a snack. Yes, if we keep on talking about food, I will just go, I am not pregnant, but I will join her in the fun Dude, of talking about snacks food. Snacks are so. delicious anytime. That's, yeah, it's that's so a given. True. So true. Well, welcome back to Kansas Thank City. Thank you welcome. so, so much. So we are, yeah, again, we're just so excited to have you. Um, now that we know a little bit about your background, um, let's kind of dive into the college admissions process. Um, what do students need to know overall? So I think that what you really need to be thinking about overall is a place that's going to be a good fit for you. And that's sort of complicated. Students receive a lot of very conflicting messages. First of all, you know, go to the place that, you know, the best place that will accept you based on your SAT scores and your grades. Mm -hmm. And that isn't necessarily the place you're going to be happiest or the place that's going to, you know, have a department that's, you know, got a major that you're interested Mm -hmm. in or where you're going to really feel like you're finding a community. There's just, you know, there's a lot of factors and ultimately your college choice should make you happy because right. ideally you're going to be spending three to four years there. Mm-hmm. So that isn't necessarily the most competitive. Um, obviously, affordability is also going to be a factor in yes. that and that gets to be a whole other confusing variable. And I think just trying to sort out like the mess of you know confusing factors. How far do I want to go? How expensive can I afford? Mm-hmm. What kind of schools are going to be good for me? Where's going to have my major? What's you know going to be the best quality school? Trying to sort of have a matrix of all those factors can be so confusing for kids. Right. So how do how do kids how do students start? I mean, what are we going to look for? So what do we go through the region first? Start at the region. Do I want to be on the coast? Do I want to be in the Midwest? Yeah, starting with the region is a great plan. And you know, some people really it's important to them to stay local to stay mm-hmm. close to the family. Some people are like, get me out of Dodge. I want to go to California. <laughs> I want to go to New York. You know, they right. want to try you know to flex their wings and you know go to some kind of different place. So probably the region is a great place to start. Yeah. You also want to think about the size of the campus. Like, do you want like a giant 50,000 person campus that's yes. probably a university, it has grad students, has big sports? Mm-hmm. Or do you want like a small kind of warm, you know, close-knit, close-knit. liberal arts mm-hmm. college, you know, where you're going to like know a lot of your professors in some places, call them by their first names, you know, right. really, you know, More intimate. that one-on-one connection. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that can definitely also give you like a different sense of like, wow, these are the types of schools that I should be applying to. Mm-hmm. Um, And then, you know, of course, you've also got to think, what do I ultimately want to get out of this college experience? You know, right. What kind of school will have the types of courses I want to be taking, let alone the major, but Mm -hmm. even like the types of courses, there are schools that offer courses where there will be a maximum of 12 people. And you, you know, are always, you know, with, you know, a professor who is a PhD in their field already. And, you know, Mm -hmm. and then there are also schools where you're going to, you know, And this works for some people and not for other people, where most of your beginning courses, at least in year one or two, are going to be 150 people, Mm -hmm. possibly top AITA. Mm -hmm. And like, that's a question of, does it work for you? Does it not work for you? Those are all things you got to consider. What works for you, Ilana? What what worked for you? So... I did not know what I was doing when I was applying to college. This is, you know, many moons ago. And I was like all over the map. I had big schools, small schools, state schools, Mm -hmm. you know, private colleges. And my dad had this idea. He'd gotten a brochure from Barnard College, which is a women's college in New York City. It's one of the original Seven Sisters. Yes, I've heard of it. And um, I think my dad was like, oh, man, women's college. This is like going to be great, you know, elite, you know, she'll stay out of trouble. (laughs) Like it's a a great great situation, you know, and, um, you know, but he actually had a really correct idea on this because it was, um, you know, it was a very sort of small, intimate setting, real small classes. I knew all the professors in any department where I took the classes. I think that's really important. It was so nice for me. And like it enabled me to really build these relationships with these professors mm-hmm. that I think as a 17 year old, I didn't have this appreciation of how much I would enjoy that. Yeah. But then once I was there, I was like, man, dad was really onto something. Like I love knowing I have this professor now. I'm going to take this one next semester mm-hmm. and she's really cool. And I already talked to her and right. it's awesome. And if I have a problem, I can come, you know, barging into their office and they'll talk to me about it. Yeah which was amazing. Yeah, and they have life experience. Yes. You trust them. And I got tons of guidance, like really mm-hmm. that I think I wouldn't have gotten if I'd been at this giant school where, you know, I'd have been one in 200. And at the same time, for some courses, you know, the beginning is usually like a big lecture, like yep. introduction to sociology. And because the school is ensconced in the Columbia University campus, and there's also a school of engineering right by there. It meant that there were really three undergraduate classes all taking, you know, courses at each other's campuses. Mm-hmm. So one year, 
I guess it was like the entire football team for some reason was taking sociology together in my introductory to soci- in my introduction to sociology like, why are class. These massive men. In the class? <laughs> there was there was like a row of them. They were they were they were really massive and they were you know near the front row and they often had very good questions and like entertaining observations and just, for some reason the entire football team was taking sociology well, and Barnard. And then you know there was another class where um I think it was a philosophy class that I took over at Columbia and for some reason I think a lot of engineers needed that for their distribution requirements. Uh And so I had like a class loaded with engineers that I became very good friends with. And um, it was just like such a nice setting because it gave me the benefits of this really small, you know, warm, I want to say like really warm, you know, liberal arts college, while at the same time having advantages of a huge university. And that was, you know, awesome. So I, dad really, he was on the money on that one Uh, though. (laughs) At the time I was like, dad, why are you so into this school? It's just because they sent a really glossy brochure, but he knew. (laughs) Hey, it's all about the marketing. I tell you. It was. And you know, I mean, truthfully, like I couldn't overrule him because I didn't even have that good an idea of where I wanted to go. There wasn't a school where I was like, oh, I really love this school. I was kind of like, eh. Yeah. So when dad sort of nudged me in that direction, you know, man, did it turn out he was right. And that's sometimes all you need, a Mm -hmm. gentle nudge in the right direction. It's like, man, Good job, Dad. Yeah, I remember he was like, "If I were an eighteen-year-old girl, I would go to Barnard." I was like, "Dad, that's really weird." <laughs> well, <laughs> but, you're not, Dad. So yeah, thanks, for thanks, thanks for, for me. thanks for saying that. <laughs> but but he was absolutely correct on that. Oh, I love that. That's so cool. I'm glad he nudged you in that direction. Uh, going back to what colleges are looking for, more towards an essay. So we're talking about still the college application process. What are colleges looking for in an essay? So I have these four rules of essays that I actually <laughs> think are pretty good rules for life as well because. Mm-hmm. Basically, there's rules of what you do at a party. All right. So say you're going to a party and this isn't a party with all your best friends. This is a party where maybe you like know the host, but you don't know that many people very well. So you're there. You know, you want to kind of meet people. Right. The first thing is you want to be yourself, you Mm -hmm. know, always come off in like a very genuine way. And that is absolutely true for colleges as well. I think especially the admissions officers at this point can really sniff out, you know, disingenuous types of essays where the student is just trying to tell them what they want to hear. And you don't want to do that. You want to be yourself. Or just use a lot of big words. Just because you're using big words doesn't mean it's a good story. Exactly. It doesn't mean it's a good story at all. Or like, I think a lot of kids think for some reason you have to talk about your community service. And Mm -hmm. it's great if you did community service that you really want to talk about, but that isn't the only thing that you have to talk about. Right. You know, you want to talk about something that is very much you, that represents you, that's important to you and interesting to you. And then you'll convey that interest to somebody else. Something you're passionate about. The second thing is you want to have a good story. When Mm -hmm. you're at a party, you always want to be able to like tell a good story, you know, make people laugh. That's how, you know, that AJ our song, 100 Bad Days Make 100 Good Stories, 100 Good Stories Make Me Interesting at Parties. That's 100% the same rule with colleges. Only you really want to pick one good story. Good application. Oh, yeah, exactly. Like 100 would be too many. But you want to pick a good story right. and have it be entertaining. Everyone likes a good story. And yeah. remember, the college of, uh, admissions officers are reading how many? Zillions <laughs> of these essays. You want yours to stand out by being like Absolutely. a nice, entertaining story. Yeah. So that's part two. Part three is a little bit tricky. Um, It's great if you can be funny. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever, you know, lost admission by making an admissions officer laugh. Right. Now, that is something you want to always be thoughtful about because you don't want to be off color. Right. You don't want to be inappropriate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Stuff that's funny with your friends is not necessarily going to be the same thing that an adult admissions officer is going to find funny. Yes. Yes. So you have to be careful of that. But you never know who's reading it. You never do. But like situational things that Mm -hmm. are funny, um, self-deprecating humor tends to be sometimes very amusing because it shows that you have humility and you can laugh at yourself. Yeah. You know, just sort of like, oh, look at this like odd thing that happened. You know, funny, funny in a way that is not, you know, maybe so controversial. Right. Is great. And if you can make an admissions officer laugh, they love that. Yeah. So that's fantastic. So don't be afraid to be funny. That's a really good. That's a really good point. I like that one a lot. Yeah. And you don't have to be so serious. Right. Like there's no requirement for that. Because I do. I feel like the essays, like the essay portion of the college admission process is so serious. I mean, it is. And and Um, students put a lot of, um, I don't know, just a lot of pressure on themselves to create this very perfect, 100% perfect essay. And yes, of course you want to do a great essay. But like you said, you want to have a story. You want to make it personal. You want it to be funny. Yeah. And there's like, you know, at this, it's weird because you have to strike a balance between being formal and informal. Right. And it's kind of hard to do that because on the one hand, you want it to be, it's not like you're like texting your friends here. You want it to be an Mm -hmm. essay. It Mm -hmm. really is an essay. And on the other hand, you want it to sound like a human being is writing it. 
You know, you don't yes. want it to be like mechanical and boring and flat. Right. And, you know, you want it to have this like sort of like, you know, personal aspect to mm-hmm. it. So mm-hmm. definitely being funny if you can like manage to do it in an appropriate way. And don't feel pressured to be if you're not feeling like what you're talking about is funny. But it's great if you can. Right. And then the fourth thing is you want to be careful. Obviously, at a party that has different applications than in an essay. But this is really crucial to keep in mind because people don't keep in mind word limits. Okay. If, oh, yeah. if the college says 500 words or if it's the common application and it says 650, don't like shoot beyond that. That's mm-hmm. not, you know, you want to be mindful of what the directions are. Mm-hmm. You also absolutely want to keep in mind things like grammar, mm-hmm. things like punctuation, make sure it is proofread and edited a hundred times over before you're sending it out. You cannot have sloppy mistakes in that essay because no, that's your one chance to make a first impression mm-hmm. and it's really the only impression. Yeah. So you want to make sure that that essay is very polished and ready to go by the okay. time it's seeing any admissions officers. So who's the best person to edit an essay? Maybe a parent, um, another student, a friend? So that's, yeah, that's a thing that is confusing, I think, to a lot of kids. Your parents, obviously, maybe you have a parent who's great at English, and that's awesome. You know, you're like, wow, I'm like mom's a really good writer. You know, mm-hmm. I should totally have her edit it. The problem with having people who are related to you edit your essays, and I think that this is probably true of your parents and your siblings and probably, you know, cousins and people as well, is that they love you, first of all. Yes. And so they're not maybe necessarily inclined to be as, you know, kind of to read it with a critical eye that you need right. for a college essay. As objective as maybe They're not as objective, exactly. Say a college and counselor. The other thing is they know you. You know, when you are making a funny remark, they can imagine it in your voice. And so they imagine you saying it, but you've got to have this essay read for someone who does not know you. Right. Who's got to be able to have your personality come through without already having the benefit of having known you for 18 years. Yeah, that's a really good point. So you want someone who's really, really objective. Um, Sometimes a teacher can be a good person for this. Just keep in mind that your English teacher is probably going to be inundated with Mm -hmm. essays from loads and loads of people. Mm -hmm. So you want to, if you're absolutely keen that your English teacher has to be the one to look at this, make sure you're getting to them very, very early in the year. Not like the favorite student. (laughs) Yes. And and you're not doing this like, you know, two days before it's due, which is a lot of pressure to put on your teacher and like really not cool. You have to be mindful of that. You do. And you know that they obviously have a lot of other students probably making the same requests. Mm -hmm. Some people are like, oh, my friend's a really good writer. And you may, it's great if you can have a friend give it another pair of eyes, but that should not be your final person because they're, you know, this person is the same age as you are and also applying to college and probably does not have, you know, a much stronger understanding of what the college admissions officers are looking for right, or right. how they're going to read it than you do just because you guys are kind of in the same demographic. Right. And they may they may not catch all the grammatical errors as They well. may not. Exactly. Even a really proficient friend, you know, again, this is the curse of knowing someone really well. You hear what you expect to hear. You see what you expect to see. You hear it in their voice. Mm-hmm. And it makes it harder to catch essays. It's also why we can't read our own writing very, very well. Yeah, You know, because we read exactly what we expect to and we can't catch our own mistakes. Yeah, yeah exactly. What's the biggest mistake students make when writing their own essays? So, first of all, really those grammatical errors and not following the directions. You'd be amazed how many people just submit kind of sloppy work and just don't bother to take the time That's to correct it. to me. Which is ridiculous because this is your chance to make a first impression on yes. someone who who might accept you to college, possibly give you a scholarship. You've got yeah, to take the time 100%. to do it in a good way. Also, essays that I think don't succeed well. First of all, stories that too much reflect what's already in your transcript. Mm-hmm. Like if you have your list of activities in your transcript, your essay should not be redundant about that. Right. If there's one of the activities you really want to talk about, and in fact, some questions will ask you talk about an activity on your transcript, then mm-hmm. absolutely you talk about that. But your essay should not be just like an overview of something that they're already understanding from your transcript. Well, that's boring. It is. It's super boring. And it's not telling the admissions officers anything interesting about you as a person. Yeah, or nothing new. Yeah. Or what you're going to contribute to their college or anything mm-hmm. like that. It's not giving you like a sense of personality. Um, Also, I want to say like essays that are sort of too self-flattering are very unattractive to the college admissions officers. I've read essays before where students will refer to themselves as being virtuous or, you know, like I'm a very generous person or I'm a very high achieving student. Also a very humble person. (laughs) Also very humble. Yes. I'm very, very humble. I'm a humble genius. Yes. (laughs) And like, it may absolutely be true. You may be the most humble genius who has ever, you know, crossed their campus before, but you do not. I'm going to write about it. Yes. (laughs) These are things that you never want to say about yourself in a college essay, even 
if they're true. You know, your humility and the fact that you're a good student will come through in your essays and your transcript without you needing to tell the colleges anything like that. Good so, point. Good point. Yeah. So don't don't tell them what a genius you are, and don't tell them how humble you are. <laughs> this is not a good way to start with the with the admissions officers. I feel like that's self explanatory, but I guess totally, you really do have to put it out there. It totally would be, and yet you know there are a lot of kids who you know, and totally meanwhile and. It's understandable. You know, you're a kid. You're applying to college. You want to right. put your best foot forward. You want the college to know you're humble and a genius. Absolutely. <laughs> that's where you have the editing involved. That's Maybe where you need someone to look at it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Because your parent is like, you are a humble oh, genius. you are amazing. <laughs> You are. You're the best. You're, You're the, best the most student awesome ever. student. Exactly. Right. So yeah, you don't want to be so self-flattering. If there's something about you that is great, it should come through in the essay without you telling the Absolutely. admissions officers directly. Yes. So. Okay. So give me an example of a really great essay that you've read before. So here are two great essays that I really want to talk about for different reasons. One of them was an essay um, written, I think maybe it must have been five or six years ago, by a student who ended up getting into Cornell University. So mm-hmm. quite successful. Yeah. And the essay was actually about learning to shoot as a sportsman. Okay. So, you know, marksmanship. Mm -hmm. And this is a topic that obviously could be quite controversial. People have different views Mm -hmm. about guns, about gun control, you know, could raise some eyebrows. And he really avoided all of those topics and talked about sort of the self-discipline and respect for life that he had learned through learning to be a marksman. Right. So no political or social opinions really came through in the essay. It showed a lot about him as a person, about what Mm -hmm. sort of things he values, about, you know, how he sees both himself as a sportsman Mm -hmm. and himself as an outdoorsman, about learning a new skill, which Mm -hmm. is a skill that probably not a lot of people have, specifically marksmanship. Right. And it was just an incredibly interesting and well-written essay that showed this very unique side of this person and also showed that he could be incredibly reflective Mm -hmm. about something. And, you know, it was something that in the wrong hands, this essay could have been probably, you know, kind of disastrous, you know, if he'd sort of started in one direction or another on a political mm-hmm. slant that could have neutral. Really? Yeah. It could have really alienated some admissions officers, depending on what their views were, but mm-hmm. he kept it very neutral. He kept it about the skill of marksmanship and how this had really, you know, increased his thinking about life and about nature and made him a more, more mature human being yeah. and made him learn to work hard. And it showed a lot about him. And it was a really, really nice and interesting essay, especially because like marksmanship is something I certainly didn't know very much about in general. And, you know, hearing him write about it, it really taught me a lot about a sport that I'm extremely unfamiliar with. Right. Exactly. So that was really, really cool. That's a, that's an Olympic sport. It is exactly. Yeah. And he talked about that in it. And I thought it was so interesting just because, you know, you think guns, you don't necessarily think marksmanship, right? Those aren't the associations nowadays, not nowadays. And he managed to just sort of tread this very fine line where it ended up being interesting and informative and not controversial and actually quite thought provoking. And he was very, I mean, it sounds just from what you're talking about. It sounds like he was very passionate about that as well. He was, he loved marksmen. He was a very talented marksman. And that was, you know, a thing that he obviously wanted the colleges to know, but it was really less about look how great I am and more about like, look at how hard it was to learn this skill Mm -hmm. and how much it's taught me about a bunch of other things you wouldn't even know were connected. Right. Which did was you, so interesting. Did you follow him after that or was it just an essay that you read? It was an essay that I read and I knew he got into Cornell, okay. but uh, I, I did not keep up with him. I'm sure he did very well there. He was yeah. a great writer, but uh, it would I actually be interesting did not know. to see if he went on to different marksmanship that you is know, true. Yeah, maybe. He maybe he ended up in the Olympics or, yeah. in marksmanship. That, yeah. That's a great question. Yeah, I wish I wish I knew. Interesting. Um, so if you're out there one. listening, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. If you are the marksman, please get in touch. Yes. yes. <laughs> Cause it gets smarter prep. Yes. So this one actually I have kept in touch with. This was a young man in a high school I taught at in New York City. And um, he wrote about being the only African-American member of the golf team. Okay. Which was a sort of, you know, odd thing. It wouldn't necessarily occur to you, but, Mm -hmm. um, you know, he said that people have, you know, certain associations with golf and who is playing golf. And he did not necessarily think he was fitting most people's associations. Mm -hmm. And he talked about, you know, how he felt he was received sometimes when he went to, you know, golf tournaments, being, you know, walking in on this team, being the only African-American student. Now play on like country clubs and very prestigious places. Exactly. And, you know, assumptions people would make. And I think it would have been a good essay if he had just kept it at that. But what made it masterful was what he did at the end. 
A lot of the essay was obviously about assumptions people had that were directed at him. And in the wrong hands, that could have come off as sort of sanctimonious even, Mm -hmm. though it didn't for him. He was a very good writer. But what he did at the end that was so great was um, he talked, he made it about an assumption that he had had. So at one point near the end of the essay, you find out he's matched, I guess, against another player who is only written into the roster by this person's initials. It's like, you know, C. Taylor or something like that. Right. And it turns out C. Taylor is a girl. Okay. Which he was not expecting. (laughs) And she beat. Him. No way. <laughs> yes, he gets good. roundly beaten by, you know, and he thinks he's, you know, kind of hot stuff. Yes. And then he gets beaten by a girl oh, who is it. herself another outsider in, right. you know, a sport where I think she is the only girl on mm-hmm. her boys team. Maybe there was not a girls golf team at her school. I'm not yeah. totally sure what the deal was, right. but... He was obviously not expecting this at all, that Aww. C. Taylor would turn out to be a girl. That's a good twist. And then C. Taylor turns out to be a girl and roundly beats him, and he's humbled by it. And what was so great about this essay was that it showed not only that he was, you know, aware of perceptions, but that he was aware of his own perceptions. Right. And really willing to learn from them. Yeah. You know, to like think, you know, wow, what preconceived notions have I come in with that, you know, maybe I should be looking to shake up a little bit mm-hmm. and challenge. And he was challenged in the end by, you know, someone he did not expect to be meeting on the golf course who then turned out to be a superior player. Right. And it was like such an awesome essay because he realized like, he realized in the course of the essay, like, wow, all of us have preconceived notions and I need to examine mine just as much as anybody does. And uh, he actually, I have kept in touch with, he um, went on on a full scholarship to NYU. Wow. Which was absolutely awesome. Yeah, that's so cool. And uh, now he is um, a journalism intern at one of the major news publications. And um, I think he's going to go be a journalist. So yeah, he's a really, really awesome kid. Yeah. So See, yeah. And, and both of those examples of essays are, you know, those are things that they are on the transcript. So mm-hmm. I'm a marksman. I, I play golf. They are all but, things that are on your resume, but they're stories within. Yes. That have really pulled through. Absolutely. And that was what was so interesting about them. They aren't just like, look how great I am at the sport, though. Mm-hmm. Both of them obviously were great at the sport. There were stories about things that you can't tell from the mm-hmm. transcript. One of them is about this kid, you know, developing respect for life and realizing how hard he has to work to be good at something. Mm-hmm. Another one is about this kid who realizes just as much as he himself has been subject to preconceived notions, he also has had preconceived notions Mm -hmm. and has had to, you know, open up his mind about things. And I think that what made both these essays so successful is they both gave the colleges a sense of what the student writing was going to bring to the college in question. You know, someone who's open-minded, someone who's hardworking, someone who's willing to learn, someone who wants to be friends with peers who are different from them. Yes. And who realizes they'll be bringing something different to the table. Absolutely. And those are all things like the colleges are like, yes, you know, bring that to us. Yep. We want that on our team for sure. What about essays um, that are really horrible? (laughs) (laughs) I feel like oddly, like I totally think I wrote this essay in high school. Like essays that are so patently obvious and I hate to go keep going back to this but to your transcript they're like the marching band taught me leadership camaraderie and organization <laughs> snooze sorry I just <laughs> fell asleep snooze. for a moment yes, exactly so like sorry. you're hearing about it so like snoozy essays that are like redundant from your transcript that don't bring like a character to life you know it's you want to really you don't want to be telling the college's I learned to put aside my preconceived notions or I learned to work hard. These essays told that to the colleges without stating it Mm -hmm. explicitly. The minute you're stating it explicitly, your story is basically going downhill and you're (laughs) losing everyone. It is boring and weird and sanctimonious Mm -hmm. and you don't want to be doing that. You want that story to carry the message. How many cups of coffee, like the, the, whoever reads the essay is like, I wonder how many cups of coffee they have per day. Oh my God. I'm going to read 15 essays per hour, right? Probably a lot of coffee because so many of those essays are so criminally boring like and the thing is like I remember doing this myself so like I'm in no way immune to this this is one of those you know practice do as I say not as I do things I totally wrote something about how being on the swim team (laughs) (laughs) you know leadership and this and that and the other thing I mean and you know at the time you know I also made the cardinal mistake of having my mom read my essay and then this is how how long ago this this is how you learn this is is, is why she's so good at what she does no I'm like mom why did you let me submit that terrible essay she's like I didn't know any better I thought it was good exactly (laughs) which is exactly again why you don't want your parents reading your essays because they don't necessarily know my mom is like I thought it was cute and I'm like I mean you know for if it's your kid it probably is yeah but of course it is you know you want to do is cute you want like a great story to tell the message to to convey that message for you you don't want to be like hammering the admissions department with a boring things that they can already see on your transcript and be telling them a message instead of showing them through a story yeah so 
anything where it's just, you know, a flat repeat of your transcripts is terrible. Big no-no. Another thing you really want to avoid is in the context of telling stories, you don't want to tell stories that are going to reflect you or other people in a negative light. And that's something I think Mm -hmm. to be very careful about. Again, goes back to this idea of what you think is funny may not be what the admissions department is funny, but you know, stuff that happened at high school parties and whatever, Mm -mm. big no, no for transcript uh, for, for um, your admissions essay, excuse me. Um, Things that are controversial that might've been against school rules or anything like that. You don't want to put that in there. You know, even if you really do think it was a great learning experience, which it might've been, you don't want it to end with you (laughs) in detention. (laughs) Try (laughs) another one. Yeah. And Anything that might reflect something else. (laughs) Exactly. Anything that might reflect you in a bad light or even reflect your peers in a bad light, you do not want to be having that in there. Absolutely not. Yeah. And obviously also like references to drugs and alcohol, this should go without saying, but they do not belong in your college admissions essay. And you'd be surprised how many students somehow think that that's going to be, you know, you know, offbeat or clever, but you just don't want to play that game with Never. the admissions officers. Very, very risky. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. I completely agree. Going back to college lists a little bit, how do you want to talk about that? Touch on that a little bit more? Um, just how to students, like how do they just start building one? I mean, it's so overwhelming for so many students. So this could something that I could literally talk about for like hours, but just in a sort of brief way, what I think that you really need to start thinking about as far as your college essays is you need a list first of safety schools schools, mid-range schools, and reach schools. Mm -hmm. Your safety schools are the ones where you're pretty sure that it is in the bag. Um, Maybe you already know that they automatically accept a person with insert whatever ACT score is and Mm -hmm. you have it. Um, You know, maybe you already know that you have some family connection that's really going to work for you there. So you want your safety schools and have a couple of those that not, they shouldn't be, you know, schools where you're like, oh, this is a bad school. This should be a school you wouldn't mind going to. Yep. Um, You're going to be there for three, four years. Yeah, exactly. It should be a school that you're pretty sure like 90% is going to accept you, Mm -hmm. but you wouldn't mind going there. Then you want your mid range schools. And, um, those ones are going to be schools that you most likely will get into. You'd be like, yeah, you know, if I were a betting person, I'd say they'll probably accept me. Mm-hmm. I'm in a good range for their ACTs, you know, a good range for their grades. They have a major I want, but, you know, they're not as sure of a bet. Mm-hmm. And then you want your reach schools. And those are your real, like, you know, moonshot schools, right. you know, schools where you're like, wow, that would be my dream. Mm-hmm. And obviously it's really hard to get into. Those are probably schools that everybody finds hard to get into. And there's mm-hmm. a certain amount of luck involved in getting into them. Yes. It isn't just how great a student you are, right. how great your ACTs are. Mm-hmm. But um, you want to have a couple of those as well. Um, Harvard at one point came to talk to my students in the Bronx and said, let us surprise you. And I thought that was a really great way of thinking about it. You know, Harvard I think is a reach school for absolutely everybody in the country. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, isn't even necessarily the right school for some people, but Mm -hmm. for sure it is a reach school. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if that is, you know, if you have a place like Harvard that you absolutely want to go to and, you know, you're like, man, I don't think I'll get in, but you know, maybe, Maybe I mean, there's a chance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, maybe is what everybody says about a school like Harvard, which has, I think like what a 5% admissions rate right now. Yeah. Yeah, It's like, everybody's a maybe for a school like that. And you know, if you absolutely love it, give them a chance to surprise you. Yeah. I like how they said that. They did. It was a really positive message. And I think that some of our students even applied there afterwards. So yeah. Awesome. Did you you get in? Do you know? Unfortunately, they did not get into Harvard, but they got into some really other great schools and, you know, and I think it showed them that all good schools really should have that kind of, you know, Mentality. logic behind them. You know, let yeah. it surprise you. Yep, absolutely. Are there any other tips on how to prepare for college that you can give us, our listeners? Um, I would say try to do some college visits. That mm-hmm. would be um, a good one. And I know that those can be cost prohibitive, especially when airplane travel is involved. Yeah. But um, it's good to sort of get a feel of a college by actually going there, if at all possible, walk around the campus, Mm -hmm. talk to some students. You don't even need to do an overnight visit if that sounds completely weird and stressful. You know, just like even spending a day walking around the campus is probably completely fine. Starting um, as a sophomore, maybe? Literally, maybe if you're in the area. Start as freshmen and sophomores. Mm -hmm. I remember visiting UVA as a freshman because my cousin was about to be a senior. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, his... Might as well. Yeah, my aunt was like, want to come along on his college tour? I was like, sure, sounds good. And I went and, you know... I decided it probably wasn't the right school for me. Yeah. But it gave me a sense of what kind of school wasn't. And that's actually, I think, a great point to mention. Visiting colleges can be really helpful, not just for realizing what does work for you Mm -hmm. and what kind of school you do want, but what kind of school does not work for you. Absolutely. And that is, I think, even even like a more valuable lesson. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I went to the University of Pennsylvania to visit uh, my cousin there, a different cousin there at one point. And um, I think it was a weekend where they were having a major football game. And it was um, really, there were like kind of a lot of parties. It was very, you know, fraternity and sorority Mm -hmm. sorority oriented. And for some people, that is a perfect environment. For me, I would have found that like extremely stressful. Mm -hmm. I was not interested in like a lot of Greek life. Very Mm -hmm. overwhelming. Yep. And I was like, you know what? This is a really nice school. Obviously great academically, but it's not for me. And I didn't apply there. Yeah. So check that off the list. And didn't apply to schools like it either. I was like, okay, I think I'm realizing I don't want a school that has like Greek life as a major component. And some people love Greek life. My cousin loved Greek life. Right. But that's an even better insight. I was about that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's fine. Cross those kind of schools off the list. To realize what kind of school you don't want to be at is as valuable, if not more, as to realize what kinds of schools you do want to be at. So it helps you narrow it down. Very good. Oh, Alana, thanks so much for coming on our show. Thanks so much for having me. It was really fun to be here. I feel like we've had so much useful information. I hope so. Thank you. And absolutely, you know, feel free to come talk to me about any of this. This is uh, stuff that everybody needs a little bit of guidance to go through. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Alana. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks so much for listening. Join us next week as we talk with one of our master level tutors about what works for her students and what doesn't work so well for others. And as always, if you enjoy listening to our podcast, please give us a five star rating and make sure to give us a positive review. If you need more tips surrounding the college prep process, visit our website at getsmarterprep.com. See you next week.